Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, or sound effects, After Effects templates, or even 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash frame rate. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. Plus, more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial at 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE11. Data is the new oil, talent is the new goal, sharing is the new currency. Freak is the new geek, geek is the new chic, weird is the new charming. Pretending to be a lesbian is the new cool, poor is the new rich, must the new moon. Technology is the new cigarette, paper is the new vanilla, I don't have internet, it's the new TV. Text message is the new love letter, I miss you is the new please. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 102. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining us today is Scott Wilkinson. Hey! So glad to be here. And who are you? It's awesome. I'm Brian Brushwood. I'm sorry, it I is. cut you off. I'm, just, oh, yeah. I'm jealous. I'm jealous of his physical, corporeal body here. I mean, look at him. He's all meat and flesh and physically there in Petaluma. How do, how do you do sad. it, Scott? How do I do it? <laughs> yeah, no, he was up for uh, the Tech Guy, right? That's right. That's I, was up here, I was up here uh, filling in for Leo on the Tech Guy radio show, having a great time. Answered a bunch of questions. Had a couple of interesting guests, and uh, then I figured, you know what the heck, I'll stick around, I'll do uh, Home Theater Geeks, which we just finished, and, and uh, you know, you said, hey, how about sticking around for frame rate? And I said, you bet. Thank you for sticking around, we love having you, and uh, we've got a, uh, a very special guest to join us to talk about his movie, It's the Big Story. This just in, The Big Story. We uh, mentioned The Root Kit uh, last week on the show, and Jonathan Schieffer, writer and director of The Root Kit, is uh, very kind enough to uh, Skype in and say hello and talk to us a little bit today. How's it going, Jonathan? I'm doing well, yeah. Hey, uh, Good to be here. Thanks thanks for joining us. Uh, I saw your cameo in your trailer on Kickstarter, uh, which, was, which was cleverly done. Tell people a little bit about what The Root Kit is uh, and, and what the pitch is on Kickstarter. Uh, the Root Kit's a story about computer hackers um, who discover a plot to monitor all internet activity. Um, uh, the pitch video I did on there, I actually had the idea of pitching a real studio, uh, but since I don't want their interference in, in my plans and plots, um, I thought it would make a cool uh, pitch video on Kickstarter. So I got my actors together and, and we did this. And there's a clever reveal. Uh, it, you see a person playing Jonathan uh, pitching to the to the studio execs, and then at, at a certain point, not it's kind of a spoiler alert, I guess, but uh, they it, it six minutes out, are gone. Yeah, yeah. These these guys are the actors that are going to be in the root kit if it gets funded. Uh, you are right now eight thousand of your fifty thousand dollar goal. You've got eighteen days to go. So the idea is to make a a, a hacker movie that's actually accurate, right? Yeah, I mean that's 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 really the goal, um, or at least on par with something like war games or sneakers. Yeah. So well, and I think that's a good way to put it is that uh, having something accurate, I assume, doesn't mean that it needs to be tedious because obviously hacking in real life does tend to be a very tedious affair. How do you plan to, or is this something you address in the video? How do you plan to keep it exciting for everyone at home who doesn't maybe understand the tech side of things? 
Uh, well, you know, that's that's plot and acting. Um, <laughs> the dialogue is 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 tech heavy, but hopefully, what we're aiming at is is it'll sound kind of like uh, CSI, where they where they talk medical speak, and then people who understand it get it, and people who don't, you still get a great show. That's the golden balance, right? Is to be able to actually have a story that is authentic. I, we're doing Dragnet on the autopilot show, and one of the things that Jack Webb was committed to in that show from the very beginning, and, and with some resistance from NBC, was, I want this to be authentic. He would get cops to come to the shootings of the TV show with their badges, and they would borrow them for the per- period of the time that they shot. So they were actually using real cop badges. He wanted real stories. He wanted, he wanted actual code names uh, used. And it, it sounds like you're sort of in a long way a tradi- in, in that tradition of saying, I want a good story, a compelling story, but I want it to be true. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely it. In fact, um, in order to pull this off, I'm not a hacker myself. I, can, I know enough about computers to, to make a, a, a compelling story, but I've, I've recruited some of my computer science friends who are, are pretty intense hackers, a um, couple security experts, and uh, just a, a, a freelance code guy um, does one, writes one of the versions of Firefox by himself, pretty much. Uh, they're, they're my consultants. So um, they're, we're going to be making the screens uh, so everything that we're talking about is going to be actually on the screen. Uh, in it's going to be you know not fancy CGI stuff, but it'll be a uh, uh, command line. So, so my lawyer awesome. makes me my lawyer makes me say that we're not actually going to be hacking; that all hacks will be simulated. <laughs> but uh, is that is that for reals? Like your lawyer is that concerned about like? Uh, oh, yeah, she's freaked out. She she's really scared about this because we're gonna be we're gonna basically be showing people how I mean summarizing, but how to break into home networks, how to uh, run a DDoS attack, that kind of stuff. So it's wow. Gnarly. But does she understand the culture and how, first of all, hacking isn't a bad thing in and of itself. It's what kind of hacking you're doing. But also the idea that a lot of these white hat hackers do this sort of thing and make it public so that you can defend against it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've tried to explain the logistics yeah. of it to her. But but she's I mean, thankfully, she's she's pretty paranoid about it. And so I'm I'm covering all my bases. Um, mostly what we're concerned about is is the devices that we'll be using. Um, we've yet to get a lot of permission for them, and we're not sure that the companies are going to be super cool with it. So, uh, what to do with the logos to avoid lawsuits? Uh, mm-hmm. That's 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 one of her big concerns too. But, I but like I it, said, go ahead. I say I was going to say I, I would think any product placement would be would be good. They would want they would like that. But I suppose being associated with hacking, maybe not. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of the argument that happened with uh, Breaking Bad is that the, the the show is incredible, and everybody who watches it loves it, but. Uh, they had a really hard time finding advertisers because who wants to be associated with a show that promotes meth baking? Yeah, <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken wasn't beaten down the door to be the place where <laughs> Fring was the manager, right? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, well, just so, so so folks get a little taste uh, of what's going on. Of course, they can go to your Kickstarter, and we'll have a link for that in the in the show notes. But uh, kind of generally speaking, what's the rough outline of the plot? I. I um... I was hoping to get to this. Um, the I haven't said this publicly yet, but I, I want to tell you here. Um, the idea starts out with uh, uh, one of our the lead hacker is hired by a guy who believes his wife is cheating on him, and so he hires uh, the hacker to break into his wife's computer to see if she has in fact done that. He breaks into it. It leads him to uh, the guy with whom she's having the affair. And it turns out that that guy works for a government contractor, and there the trouble ensues. So you start going down the uh, the rat hole, so to speak, and you find out yeah, a yeah. much bigger deal than what they were first looking for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He he sl- he slurps all their projects, goes through them one by one, and finds some pretty nasty stuff. I don't know about you guys. That sounds awesome. I'm already I'm already in. I'm there. Yeah, dude, one hundred percent. Are you kidding me? So, where does this uh, is this the kind of project that you think uh, could be a you know major motion picture release, or is it something that uh, where, where's where are you hoping that this ends up when people are able to see it? Assuming that you hit your backing, my main goal is to get it to as many people as possible. Um, theater, uh, if if it can be profitable, yeah, I mean that's that we'll do that. But I'd like to do a day and date release, which hasn't really been done very well yet, um, and. For obvious reasons, because theaters want to have a have a monopoly on movies when they come out, 
Um, but the the idea is that uh, that I, I'm making a show. Well, the, and and it, and it comes back to the underlying principle of what I'm getting at in the movie, which is that um, we. I mean, why I wrote it in the first place was uh, I've heard a lot of interviews, and and some friends of mine have told me that that the tech sector uh, is really looking for people to uh, hire. They don't have enough qualified employees to to go to. And so I want to give people the knowledge that that if you apply yourself with technology today, with information that's currently available, uh, there really isn't a limit. And and so um, at, in in pursuit of that goal, uh, the more people I get to see it, the 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 better it is. Although the likelihood of it screening in China is very low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, an authorized screening anyway. Yeah. Uh, Hit yeah, only yeah. in the chat room wants to know where it's going to be shot. Is it'll be in the L.A. area? Yeah. W- um, well, because of the budget, we can't really afford to fly anyone anywhere. So most of it'll be in L.A. Your and, budget and is or- a little bit in Orange County. Some of it in uh, San Bernardino County. Your budget uh, is, you know, for a movie, exceedingly low. I mean, your your Kickstarter goal is fifty thousand, right? Yeah, that's like yeah, that's like almost nothing com- compared to what they what it costs to shoot a movie these days. So I'm sure you're doing it with uh, consumer uh, cameras, which are now certainly plenty good enough to do professional quality stuff. There was a movie, um, I think it was last year, called Tiny Furniture, and it did it did very well. It, it pretty much took the uh, I think the the People's Award at South by Southwest, and then it got theater released. That movie was filmed on a, a camera called the Canon Seven D, which I saw is now available at Costco. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's crazy. So right. um, yeah, we're, we're uh, right now. My plan is to shoot on the Five D. And the T2I as a backup camera. Um, if we completely overshoot the goal, uh, Red did something amazing uh, earlier this month, where their uh, Red One camera, their with the MX, uh, pr- a really good camera, is now like four grand. So, yeah. Oh man, um, the Red camera is awesome. Yeah, and it kind of gets back to what I was saying: is that the availability of technology and information today, there's really no walls to any of it anymore. Good point. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much uh, for sharing the plot with us, for, for breaking the news. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I dig your show, and I love the other stuff you guys do on Twit, man. All right. Like I said, like, like I said to, on, in the tweet to uh, um, the, the Security Now, Steve Gibson, that, that that's the bulk of my research. It's Security Now. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's where I learned. For like, sure. After listening to that podcast for two weeks, I learned three different easy ways to break into a home network. Absolutely. <laughs> no. For the, Yeah. I mean, that's what it's for is to let people know, like, this is how easy it is. This is why you need to be careful. These are the steps you need to take to protect yourself. Yeah. So I, it's an honor to be on here, man. Thanks a lot for the invite. I think I'm going to go home and change my password. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to use Haystacks. Oh, <laughs> when you do that. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Schieffer, uh, thank you so much. The Root Kit can be found at www.therootkit.com. Dot com. Anything else to tell folks uh, about the Kickstarter or information that they need to know? Uh, if you like it, tell your friends. Um, this is this is as legitimate a hacker movie as I can make. All right. If you if you want a good hacker movie, I, I think this is the one one to back. Therootkit.com. Thanks again, Jonathan. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Uh, so Dial TV, we've mentioned before, Brian, uh, is launching finally. Uh, there's an Elgato attachment that you can get for your, your iPad and your iPhone. Uh, and it allows you to get TV from a handful of networks, uh, mostly Fox and NBC, because they're the backers of Dial, over the air. But it's not what you think, or at least it's not what I thought when I first saw it. You're not getting the broadcast over the air like you would get from an antenna plugged into your TV. It's a special broadcast that requires dial hardware. Okay, now hold on. When you say special broadcast, this means... So the broadcast is going over the air, but not necessarily using the same HD spectrum that uh, the same that, that your aerials would for your home set, theater yeah, setup? I can't remember exactly what spectrum they're using, but yeah, they, that's essentially right. They, they, it's $100 for an adapter... Uh, which is a combination battery and antenna. 
then that plugs in and receives the, the special broadcast of Dial TV. Now, there, there is a mobile HD TV broadcast standard, which is somewhat different than the one that you have the use with your antenna on your roof. Is this what that is? If it's not what you're talking about, it's something like that, yeah, okay. essentially. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we've seen this before, Moby TV, yeah. uh, for instance. Uh, what was the other one? There was a, was it, was there an early V-cast that was actually not over the internet, or am I confusing? I that? don't I remember, remember that. Uh, but, yeah, so you get no DVR functions, you get limited uh, networks, you don't get all the major networks, they're not all on board yet. Uh, you get a handful of cities, 35 cities that it's operating in, uh, but, if, but if you really like NBC and Fox shows, and you've got $100, and you live in one of these 35 cities, I guess... This now, isn't... okay, so so, but, but after the hundred dollar adapter, is there anything else that you need? There's no subscription or anything because it's over the air. Well, no, there's not yet. That's okay. a, they put a yet in front in, oh, in most of these man. stories that I read about. So yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what uh, I'll tell you what this is great for. There's a very small market for whom this is an instant slam dunk, and that's going to be the uh, the psychotic sports fans. Those people who. The people who currently bring those little Sony Trinitron, you know, to get the over-air, the air broadcast to watch stuff, like this little gizmo they attach to their iPad, they're able to see the game that they're watching right in front of them live, only get the broadcast. That's about the only slam dunk uh, I could think for this. What about you? You're not getting, you're not getting ESPN. You're not, you're yeah, not getting most of the sports. So, I mean, it could be good for for uh, carpoolers, you know, working, go, going on the commute every day. Except for the guy driving. <laughs> yeah, but. yeah. but meanwhile, somebody else is like one person's watching whatever happens to be on in the morning. The other person's watching everything on Netflix or Hulu. This is one of those things where it's like, I know it's not bad, but I also know that the reason they're doing this is not because they think this is a great service, that they think this is the best service consumers would want. They're doing it because they've got Spectrum they don't want to lose, so they have to use it. Mm. They have to show that they're using it. And uh, they want to protect their monopoly over broadcasting. So they're trying every single thing possible to say, well, this is the way we're providing you an opportunity that we control and can later charge and monetize. I don't understand. I wonder, could someone just make a free over-the-air tuner that is the same profile and with some hardware could could run on an iPad with an app? They should be able I, to do that with the, yeah. with the mobile... Uh, broadcast standard that already exists and has for years yeah i mean maybe the problem is that your reception is wonky unless you're in like a very good area like if you're in an office or here's or another problem yeah well, maybe the problem is that nobody wants it yeah maybe yeah. that's why we're not getting this so far <laughs> thank you for speaking truth to power because i <laughs> indeed i think that's that's probably what's going on well i know i don't want it i yeah. don't care about watching tv you know while i'm walking down the street well sorry dial I'm not glad I used dial. Let's move on to yet another big story. <laughs> Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Uh, there's a couple of... Uh, we mentioned The Verge doing a, a series all last week about Internet television. Uh, and they, they have, you know, Inside the Fight for the Living Room is, is one of the articles that's up there that's worth taking a look at. There was also an interesting... Uh, part of that series called Internet Television is Where Cable Was in Early Days. This is from Don Ostroff, Condé Nast Entertainment Chief. Now, the story's by Adrian Jeffries, but it, but it quotes Don Ostroff. She won't talk about what Condé Nast is doing. She's in charge of their new entertainment group, uh, which is going to make video. They're going to they're gonna try to create content based off the articles published by its magazines. Uh, Condé Nast owns Wire, they own The New Yorker, they own Ars Technica, uh, so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. But Ostroff would talk about the com comparison of where digital entertainment is now, uh, and she compared it to cable TV in the 1970s. A lot of yes, people don't remember absolutely. cable TV existed back then. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This is, this is actually, uh, I just gave a keynote at DevLearn a couple, uh, I guess just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the, uh, fully a third of the presentation was talking about branding and about how right now in new media, we are seeing essentially, you know, when, when broadcast television came out, the first movers had the advantage. They were early entrenched and established. That's why, you know, NBC, CBS, and ABC dominated, uh, and then eventually Fox and CW it joined. It was kind of an but elegant it, transition from radio to TV in, in, in almost an unusual way where the, the incumbents, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, with a few exceptions, just kind of moved into broadcast television. 
Right. No, okay. Th those those power players did. However, the content, if you see early television, it's clear that they had no idea what to do with this new medium. They figured it's just radio with pictures. So they got their radio actors who had no on-screen presence. They ran stuff like essentially plays on stage uh, on screen. And, uh, and eventually they figured out the voice of the new medium. Same thing happens again in the 1970s. If you look uh, in the 1970s when cable got deregulated, none of the big players, none of the broadcasters, uh, it, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, they didn't invest at all because there was no audience they're like that's idiocy which is why it's the ted turners the tbs's the uh the cnn's the um uh you know hbo's those first movers were the ones who became established and entrenched and in fact nbc by the time they wanted to get in on it they originally created cnbc to just be cable nbc and it floundered because that niche had already been filled and it wasn't until they found an unfilled niche with business news programming that cnbc began to thrive and likewise you i i totally agree with this supposition because here in new media again the initial uh, audience was none. And that's why you didn't get a lot of old media investing in new media, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurial opportunities because there, the, the audience wasn't there. And now that you're seeing old media coming in, meanwhile, it's the first movers, it's the onion, it's, it's your revision threes, it's your twits who are uh, getting early market share and early dominant advantage by being first movers. And there's also weird niches. Uh, one of the things that, that she points out in this article is that you had things like the babysitting channel, uh, <laughs> where they where they were like, we're going to target babysitters and give them stuff to to for the baby to watch that's interesting to them. Or there was the channel that just streamed uh, traffic cameras twenty four hours. There was the channel that took uh, printed versions of Associated Press stories and just put them on screen with a musical background. Oh man, uh, the teleprompter corporation touted a technology that would allow advertisers to target doctors so that the program would only be sent to anyone who is registered in the service as a doctor and everyone else would get different programming. Uh, this all sounds in, in sort of a weird parallel way familiar to what we have now, which Absolutely. is like, oh, well, we can we can target things, right? Well, do you remember it's cable in the 70s? I do remember cable in the 70s, certainly. I mean, I was thinking what you were just talking about now. I mean, that's what twittv.tv is. It's, you know, targeting the tech and It's the babysitting channel. <laughs> no, it's not the babysitting channel. No, it's the geek channel. Right, right. You totally. Know? Uh, the interesting thing about this, though, is there are examples of channels that have bridged the gap, right? The Learning Channel uh, really started as a public service channel to provide learning at home. It was one of those early niche channels. We're right. going to do something that broadcast networks can't do right? Uh, because, because, because they're, it's, it does, doesn't scale to their level. The learning channel eventually was purchased by Discovery. It became a little broader. Now it's Honey Boo Boo. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's made a, an entire transformation. Yeah. And you've seen that in smaller versions with music television becoming MTV right. Right. and becoming a, a, a lifestyle program channel, right. the history, The History Channel becoming the Pond Channel. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, keep in mind, one of the uh, aspects of the similarities between where we are in new media versus 1970s cable is that just as ridiculous as some of these ideas seem to us now from the 1970s, there's going to be a lot of people who look at the early days of, of YouTube programming and channels and they're like, really? You thought this was going to be a good idea? But there's going to be other things that are counterintuitive that we never could have predicted. I mean, everyone thought... Ted Turner was crazy when he launched CNN, a 24-hour right. cable news. Exactly. And, of course, by virtue of being first, they stayed dominant for 30 years. That's a, that's a great point because I think what ha what, what's interesting to look at is what makes sense in the early days of a medium doesn't necessarily catch on and be successful. And it's, it's almost like there's no way of knowing. If, right. you, if you sit down in the 1970s and say there's a babysitting channel and there's a 24-hour news channel – they both sound as weird and as logical. Like, okay, right. they're, they're niche. They're for somebody who really wants news all the time. Most people just want it, you know, when they come home from work like normal. But there may be some people who want it in the middle of the night. The, the, not everybody's a babysitter, but there are babysitters, et cetera. One catches on, the other doesn't. I mean, we're in a well, point, I, we're in a point of, of experimentation, I think, I think. And it's like throw as much stuff on the wall as you can. See what sticks, as they say. You know, something will, and you can't necessarily predict what it's going to be. Yeah. 
Well, and keep in mind also, we do have the advantage of new media of it being in many ways a bottom up revolution because you get yes. uh, this giant, massively parallel, uh, you know, marketplace of ideas where you can have surprising things like some of the most popular channels on YouTube are, are these uh, makeup tutorials, you know, or, you know, of course, and there's this whole underground current of magic tutorial videos. That's, of course, what uh, Scam School participates in and all these things that you wouldn't think were possible. But uh, again, some of them are going to look utterly ridiculous and silly a few years from now. Well, and that, that's a really interesting parallel because the thought is that the scale of the bottom-up revolution is such now that it won't turn out like the bottom-up revolution of cable. I mean, cable had cable access channels, and there was a lot of thinking in the early days that this would revolutionize television because it was open and anybody could make TV, <coughs> and it didn't happen. When the Internet came along, a lot of people said, well, it's different because the Internet is much easier to access. You don't have to go take a class at, at Austin Community Cable. You don't have to rent really heavy equipment and lug it around. It's so much easier, and so many people have access to Internet. Uh, and so, so it'll be different this time. Plus the fact that the production equipment is much cheaper, mm -hmm. much more available. You can do a much higher quality job than you could even with cable access. You still needed, you know, a TV camera and, you know, lots of lights and stuff. And now it's... Like with the music industry, the same thing. The big studios are going away as people make really high-quality albums in their bedrooms. But the in industry is going to get uh, going to go from three billion dollars to nine billion dollars spending on online video advertising by 2017. Wow! Factor and what happened three. to cable is when the money started coming in, yeah. the big guys started paying attention. They started buying up the TLCs. They started changing them, yep. uh, and they started going after these these high-dollar audiences. Brian, do you think that's going to happen? I don't know. I'm not in the business of predicting the future, except when I'm on stage and have sealed envelopes. No, then right. I predict the future, <laughs> no, sir. no, seriously, predict the future right now. Uh, the answer is 12. Yes. I knew it. <coughs> Nailed it. All my knew money it. on 12. Uh, no, no, but do, I mean, do you, in all seriousness, do you think the chances are greater or less of that sort of thing happening because the Internet is so widespread? Uh, of what specific on the one, on the one hand you have the pattern of uh, a new technology is uh, available to a lot more people until it starts making money and then the big guys come in and like suck all the air out of the room and take it over versus the internet routes around those things very elegantly and very effectively in a way that no other medium has I, I don't know. I mean, I guess what you're really asking is is the question of media consolidation. Are we going to see moneyed interest come in and scoop up? I think you're going to see a lot of properties get scooped up. I think certainly that you've already seen that with Revision 3 getting bought by Discovery. Uh, but for every time you see that consolidation, it's going to be like a Hydra's head. There are, because of the Internet, because of its inherently decentralized nature, there are these little pockets of micro networks and micro brands and micro programming where people will put hours and hours into broadcast that'll be viewed by as few as as 100 people i mean like like last night you know me uh essentially uh, whenever i go live on justin tv i'm creating a miniature micro broadcasting network with very esoteric programming and last night i got online and i played the walking dead video game and we had a couple hundred people tune in live these are numbers that just don't even register on the radar and my motivation for doing it isn't uh, anything outside of you know brand management and doing fan service for these guys with connecting to them. And because you're able to play for different forms of currency on the internet, because there's a reason to do something like that, like, you know, I didn't make any money. And it's like, uh, I, I certainly, uh, that as a programming would be a very idiotic way for any kind of responsible business to build its brand. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that you will see some consolidation, but as much consolidation as you see, you will see even more splintering into very, very tiny pockets. And that's going to that's going to really bring into question how is how are people going to make money, which is ultimately the the goal here. T-shirts, right? don't you know? The whole internet runs on T-shirts. Look, my my uh, Teespring T-shirt. Merchandising. Merchandising. Yeah, ex some some way we got to make money. I mean, I've felt it in the publishing business. I've been a you know an editor for twenty years. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the advertising online is still very low compared to print, even though print is dying. We know that it is. Uh, but that's where most of the money still is. So the, the nut yet to crack is how are the big players or the little players, any players online going to bring in the revenue 
that they want. Yeah, I think the revenue's coming. It's just a, a long, arduous transition. And then who, well, and, and who it, gets the but, cut of the pie? Right. But again, that's that's the way these games work. In the early days, there is no money, but there's there's uh, positioning. You know, right, right now you're seeing the job. We're, we're entering the end of the first phase of early positioning. And now we're starting to see a little bit of money coming in, which we, of course, have talked about with the YouTube money that they paid for their independent channels. Uh, and uh, things are going to get a little more cutthroat. In the next, uh, it's 10 like years. throwing up, you know, like a bunch of money in the in the middle of the street. Right. You know, suddenly everybody starts scrambling, <coughs> hungrily, to, <laughs> yes. to gather it all up. All right, we got one more story that's actually a little bit related to it. It's our fourth big story, or not? At least a bit. <laughs> uh, but it actually follows on from this. Uh, frustrated video viewers don't come back. We're still in that part of online video where it's, it's not easy. It's easy to turn on your cable television now and just start flipping through channels. It wasn't for a long time. It was actually, you know, kind of, kind of difficult to install. And I remember we had this brown box on top of the TV that you had to go over and you had to press a d- depress switch to go to any of the channels above 12. Right. Uh, for, remember for that. like 13 to 24 or whatever. Right. I can't remember where it ended, but... Is that one of the ones with the slider boxes for the channels? No, like, it didn't have a slider box. It was all like dip switches for all the channels, and then it had a, a, a tuning wheel on the side because yes. when you'd press like 18, which I remember then you'd was have MTV, to center the frequency. Exactly. Sometimes it would drift off, right. so you'd have to adjust it. Right. Uh, you know, those days are gone. But, but Brian, I think you, you found this story. This is basically saying people on the Internet, if, they, if the video doesn't work right away, they, they just you're, you've lost them. Yeah, no, this is interesting. It was a study at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and uh, I thought it was interesting because it put uh, quantitative numbers to just how annoyed and how fast people get when they want to when they want to give up on stuff. Specifically, uh, I loved this statistic: uh, vi- viewers have little patience for videos that don't start immediately. After a two second wait, viewers already start turning away. <laughs> for every additional one second, the abandonment rate goes up by nearly six percent. Uh, that rate's not consistent. Some viewers have more patience with higher value content like movies uh, rather than brief clips. But uh, but eventually, and this is another great thing, thanks to the giant decentralized nature of the Internet, we will get to uh, essentially just by studying the existing data, find out the precise amount of time th- that people will wait for a video to load before they get so annoyed. And hopefully, and th- this is going to be a weird conclusion to make, but I hope they isolate that number and figure out that that's the exact length of time that an advertisement should be. Yes. And then what they'll do is they'll reach the maximum number of people with the minimum amount of intrusiveness and uh, and get the maximum amount of ad dollars into new media content. And that was one of the things that All Things D uh, in that story, in that interview that we were talking about with the, the woman from Condé Nast, uh, is that right now we're getting all these very short videos because people think, well, that's all people will have the patience for. But that's going to get longer and longer. And we already see, like, people will watch a high-quality ABC show Absolutely. on the Internet yep. if they believe that it's worth it. And one thing I've noticed is not not 30-second pre-roll, not 60-second re- pre-roll. You, they're doing, like, three, four ads before these things. I was right. watching Arrow right. on the CW app on my iPad, AirPlayed to my Apple TV, so it was just like watching Arrow on TV. It looked great. But I would have three ads at the beginning. And here's the thing. Because I'm on my couch and I'm watching it on my television, it just didn't bother me. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like, you know. You're used to seeing ads in TV It's like shows. watching live. Like, yeah. oh, I kind of wish this was on a DVR so I could fast forward. But fast forward is sometimes kind of clunky anyway. These are shorter ad breaks than they have on broadcast. So, and they're all at know. the beginning? They're all clustered? You don't well, have... they still have ad breaks in the middle of the oh, show, too. Yeah. Okay. But they start with ads. They don't start with the show, which is actually different than television. Correct. Where at, at, at the hour, they start right. with the show because they don't want to lose you. Right. I wonder if that yeah. will change. Yeah. All right. Shall we uh, um, thank one of our sponsors, Brian? Yes. If only we had a sponsor. We somebody do. who could Somebody who what? could provide he, valuable he, funds he, to keep frame rate alive. Unfortunately, nobody loves this show, Tom. I what? heard that on the internet somewhere. Actually, that's not true, Brian. Pond5 has been very good Name, to us. Uh, wait. Wait, Pond Five? Yeah. Are you talking about the the stock media marketplace that has all all the videos and the sound effects and the clips and the and the the three D models uh, that you're able to royalty free put into any of of your created content? Uh, yeah, that's exactly the one. I mean, they're pretty much a sponsor almost every week these days on Frame. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Uh, <laughs> but that's that's amazing, though. 
That's uh, These guys are fantastic. You know what I love about them is that it's a two-way street. Not only can you find just about it. Here, na- Scott, Scott. Yes, yes. Na- name anything. Anything in the world. Name uh, it. Star Trek. Star Trek. There you go. We're going to search for Star Trek and see what they have here on Pond 5. So obviously That's they're not going to have the Star Trek movies. But yeah, but look at that. Star but look at that. You could we start making your own. Ships? Look, that is a freaking Star Trek-like starship, too. No kidding. Look at that. Now, suddenly, totally uh, royalty-free. You can make your. You can make it called Star Walk, your own right. rip-off movie. They got people. Here, let, let me hear some sound effects here. What do we got? Pond5.com. Well, that's the watermark. But if you buy it, you don't hear that Pond5 good. part. See, so I'm already trans- that behind the... <laughs> That enterprise looking thing. You've got a you've got a transporter sound effect right there. You've got now you're going on warp speed. They got this weird colors. Oh, that's so cool. You're putting together a science fiction movie and you haven't done anything except download from Pond Five. Yeah, and here's my favorite part is that it's a two way street. If you're a media creator, if you're somebody who made that model of a of a copyright free version of an enterprise or something, you can take that 3D model, make it available on pond5.com. Other people pay you for work you've already done. Yeah. So anyway, you're thinking like, oh, these are probably really expensive. No, they're not. But just to give you a sense of what they have there, you can get fifty free stock media downloads. At P O N D the number five dot com pond five dot com slash frame rate. That's pond five dot com slash frame rate this month. We're about we're a little over halfway through November, so a little you, over. Might, you might I'm checking my month watch, which doesn't exist on my <laughs> on my wrist. Uh, pond five dot com slash frame rate. Go we're still waiting on the pond five movie. That we want people to put together. Oh, that's together. right. Yeah, no, we, we kicked it out there. And now's the right time to do it because you could get, um, uh, I believe, 50 free clips, right? If you go to pond5.com. We just uh, gave you, like, just do that search for space, Star Trek, anything like that. And you get royal, you know, royalty-free downloads. You pay for them once. You get to use them. Uh, pond5.com slash frame rate. We thank them for their support of frame rate. Let's slip into the slipstream. So I don't know about you, Brian, but I got all excited when I saw that Warner Brothers had released an app with television shows on it. Did you see this before it got yeah, corrected? I missed it. It was apparently like a blip on the radar. It was there and then back seas. So if you caught this uh, and didn't hear the correction, <coughs> Warner Brothers does have an app that allows you to get free versions of shows like Gossip Girl, Big Bang Theory, uh, even uh, uh, the, some of the other from, from various networks, right? Oh, uh, Vampire Diaries. They're not all CW shows because Warner Brothers doesn't own CW, but they are a production house that makes television shows, many of which they, they sell to CW because they're a minority owner, but many, like the Big Bang Theory, they sell to other networks. And I thought, well, this is the signpost along the road. The producer has found a way to take the shows and sell them direct to us. And they were giving away some like limited amount of free shows if you liked them on Facebook, etc. But basically, it was like, just buy the shows at the day after they air and you're on your way. Well, turns out it was accidentally published in the U.S. iTunes store. Ooh. It was meant for Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. They get everything. Oh, man. Like I'll floods. tell you what, man. We are getting more and more emails from people in little pockets all over the world who, uh, who have awesome things that we don't get. Like, Did I you believe, notice um, that this week? All the HBO goes? Like, there's one in Romania now? and Really? In Portugal or something? Or No, no, no. It was like in Brazil. or I, I forget where the email came from. But I don't it was just a whole mean discussion. HBO Go. I mean, like, they now have an online service that you could pay for to get HBO without having a cable. A system. subscription, yeah. I'll tell you, man, it's uh, it's Spotify all over again. It's going to be, the, we're going to get increasingly annoyed and it's just going to come to the United States. I'm so excited to get rid of my full-on cable subscription for HBO Go. Anyway, so if you are in the Benelux countries, uh, <laughs> the equivalent of $3 for HD or for standard def, $4 uh, for HD versions, and then season passes, uh, for instance, a bag, Big Bang Theory or Vampire Diaries, 38 bucks in standard def, 45, 44 bucks in HD. Um, I, I guess it's still a signpost on the road that it's happening at all anywhere, right? right exactly. Uh, but the reason they could do it in these countries is that the licensing agreements and distribution agreements are friendly enough to allow them to get away with it, I, is, is my guess there. Uh, Voodoo is bringing their HDX streaming to PCs and downloadable movies. Now, where was this? Uh, was this available on some other entity before you had to buy PCs the box. before now? You had to buy the Voodoo box. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. 
And it looked great. I remember that. Oh, yeah. That was the big advantage to the Voodoo boxes. That's right. Is that they had the best-looking videos. So now HDX 1080p and 720p versions of the videos come into PCs, uh, which makes that... I don't know. I think that puts the Voodoo service like back into main contention. I didn't think it was Absolutely. particularly out of contention, but it no, no, no. gives it a big advantage. Yeah, <clears throat> because you can you now have a much wider set of platforms to, to view it on. You don't have to get the box. Um, and a lot of people are using computers, you know, as their primary source now. So I yeah. think that's great. Although you still don't get the higher quality audio that you would get on oh, the Voodoo really? box. Oh, really? Oh, okay. That is limited to stereo for now. Um, oh, that's too bad. But maybe HDX did have uh, Dolby Digital 5.1, right? It did. Well, it does. It does. It does on the box. On the Voodoo box. Yeah. Right, okay. Right. Uh, also, we got, we got a lot of home theater geekish stories in the lineup cool. today. Uh, initial product projects from 3Net Studios... Uh, for 3D and Ultra HD shows are shooting the first native 4K project. Ooh. No one will be able to watch it <laughs> in 4K <coughs> Well, nobody except somebody who buys one of these $20,000 yeah, right, 4K right. TVs. Well, and there's not any channels to distribute that actually broadcast in 4K yet either. Right. So you'd have, right. to, you'd have to buy a disc of it. Um, or, or have it stream. Yeah, you could have it stream. That's true. Or download. But 3Net is a joint venture from Sony Discovery and IMAX that is a 3D channel Correct. Uh, that you can get. Now, they, will, they do not broadcast in 4K, but maybe someday they will, and now they're getting set up. This is sort of like back in the 90s when we heard the first high-def shows were right. being shot, right? Right, exactly. Same sort of deal we're seeing now. And 3Net, <clears throat> 3D broadcasting in general is not really doing very well. I, I got DirecTV specifically for 3D. Because I wanted to watch the Olympics in 3D, but then I wanted to, you know, sort of experience 3D broadcasting. And for for the most part, uh, well, 3Net, I think, has got stuff on all the time. But another, uh, N3D is the other one that was the Olympics were on. And it continually just says, stay tuned for upcoming content. I'm just going, come on, what's going on here? But, uh, you know, obviously 4K is the next 3D, in a sense. You know, it's the next technological advance. And I've always been concerned that we're going to have these 4K TVs and no content. But again, as you say, that's exactly what happened with HD. Right. And it's going to catch I, up. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going into broken record mode here. It's yeah. like I think it's great that they're making the content. I think it's a chicken and egg type thing that yeah. you got to have content to get people excited. However, I think I think telling people that they want 4K displays so that they can watch really pretty movies is a terrible idea. We don't even see 4K d displays truly being used when we go to the movie theater. That's you go correct. to the movie theater, you're watching a half of 4K. The the 4K will will work and it will do well, but it's going to be as some other application. It's going to be as computer monitors. It's going to be as video walls and the ambient backgrounds or something. But but this idea that that even crisper movies is the purpose for a 4K, I fundamentally don't believe will happen. I tend to agree, um, especially since the standards that are being talked about now still have 8-bit color, which is a technical term to, to mean that uh, the range of colors is, is going to be the same as it is now. Uh, and it's like, well, why, you, know, you can obviously bump that up. Why don't you? you know, why don't you make other aspects of it better? And they're, they're just not. So are we just going to skip over to 8K? <laughs> Maybe they are. The people who saw those demos, they had some at the Olympics. At the Olympics. In London, yep. where, I mean, uh, Sharif Sark from Engadget was like, forget 4K. Forget, it's just not going to happen. It's not worth it. Go straight to 8K. There are no more pixels. The pixel is dead. <laughs> do, you, do, do you think that, that he's like overdoing it? When I do that? think he's overdoing it. I mean, I think 4K, you can't see the pixels in 4K unless you have your nose up against the screen. He had his nose against... I think he actually did have his nose against the screen. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Warner's Archive On Demand disc service uh, is uh, kicking off Blu-ray availability. They've had this for regular DVD for a while, uh, where rare movies in their catalog, you can have them manufacture on demand. Now, it's a limited amount of titles. not like you can pick anything that's ever been you know, recorded by Warner, by Warner Brothers. Yeah. But, but they're uh, starting with Gypsy and Death Trap, that you essentially order, and they burn the disc as you order them. Yeah, it's like uh, publish so, on demand. Though. Exactly. You know, book publishing on demand. I, I, I'm kind of surprised it took this long to get to that point. Yeah, you know, well, and th it was... Go ahead, Brian. Well, I was going to say, like, the, the curious thing to me is the entire value of having a, a one-off print on demand for uh, video discs is to have a massively large library, something that it would be uh, ineffective or, or a stupid thing to keep inventory on to have offset printing for everything, and then just uh, out of this giant 
mile wide ocean that's only an inch deep have people grab here and there. But if you're going to launch it by only having two, I mean, I suppose you should, you, I, I don't understand the thinking because if you're only going to launch it with two titles to begin with, then you negate the one benefit to, to having this kind of print on demand service. Well, is that it? Is it, are, they're only, they're, they're these launching two? with two titles and then they'll add titles as time goes on. Oh, okay. Well, you know, you got to start somewhere, I guess. Well, and, and, and well yeah, they, but why not start with a thousand titles? I mean, maybe, they've got the Are titles. they properly digitized to look good in Blu-ray? That's the question. Oh, that's a good point. So the question is, should they have waited longer while they digitize more movies so I, they can come yeah. out with a big spread? They or should they do this should. and say, all right, we did two really well. Here they are. We're going to go back and do more and come, up, come out with those as we do them and do them right. I'm with Brian on this. I would have waited until they had a yeah. bunch more titles. You know what they may be worried about. They may be worried well, if they waited until they had a bunch more titles that people wouldn't be using Blu-ray anymore. <laughs> Blu-ray's going to be around for a while. Yeah. You know? It's not going to disappear anytime real soon. All right. I'm talking about the next Xbox having Blu-ray built in. I feel like, oh, really? Yeah. That seems like going backwards. Oh, no, no, no. It has to. It, it, it needs to just because uh, because I'm not going to buy a Blu-ray player. The only way a Blu-ray player is going to enter my house is either is built into a game console. Why does Microsoft console? care, though? They just sell you the movie as a download, and then and you get access to it in the cloud, so you don't have to worry about storage. It's well, you know, that was, the, that was the rumor. You remember back in the days of HD DVD versus Blu-ray, uh, you had, uh, you know, of course, uh, Sony had the Blu-ray player built in and, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft Xbox had the regular DVD and they bought the, they had the HD DVD attachment on there. Right. Uh, like they were kind of obstinate, refusing to kind of really pick a side in that battle because the, the rumor was that Microsoft wanted them to continue to fight and in that time have direct downloads come in and, and steal their lunch, which uh, which kind of happened, not not quite as, you know, cut and dried as as I'm sure they were hoping. But uh, I could totally believe that given their strategy since then. And yet, as you say, that it didn't quite happen that way. Unlike uh, mu music downloads, MP3s came in and and uh, ate the lunch of a DVD audio and SACD. Mm -hmm. You know, they, those are both superior formats, and what ate their lunch was an inferior format because consumers preferred convenience over quality. Now, in the case of video, that wasn't as clear-cut, as you say. Uh, and Blu-ray is still around and being released. A lot of things are still being released on it, and I think... Uh, uh, it's Xbox coming out with a Blu-ray player? Is that what well, you said? Well, the rumor is that the next version of the Xbox would have Blu-ray capability. I and you know what? It may be s as simple as they're going to use Blu-ray as the format for the games in the next console. Exactly. And so why not let it play movies at exactly. the same time? Exactly. That, yeah. so, that makes a lot of sense it, to me. Not so much an intentional thing as like, right, well, right. it would be stupid not to... Well, th that, th yeah. think about how many video games that, you know, now when you download off of Steam, it's very common to have, you know, 10 gigabyte games uh, downloaded. Uh, obviously, if you were able to put that in a dense format like Blu-ray, it would make things a lot easier on a next generation console. And right. I'm sure the Blu-ray Association is like, hey, Microsoft, we'll give you some really favorable terms to use Blu-ray as your game format for the optical disc, even right. though that you didn't have to. Right. Uh, that may help out too. Right. Let's take a look at Tube Tops. I mean, oh, I meant I see I, what I you did we could, there. No, we can do, do this segment. Sure. <coughs> Why not? Uh, the Nintendo Wii U came out in North America on Sunday. Mine is in the mail right now. I was an idiot, and I didn't pre-order it fast enough, so I haven't gotten mine yet. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the big disappointments is that the TV service that Brian and I have been excited about isn't available out of the gate. However, Netflix said, hey, guess what? We will be available out of the gate. Uh, when, you, when you download <laughs> your 5 gigabyte update... For the Nintendo Wii U, and you plug it in, A, don't unplug it, and don't lose your internet connection, because you might brick it. But B, you'll get Netflix. Yeah, and, and I guess that, that certainly makes sense, because Netflix already had their app available on uh, the Nintendo Wii service uh, as it already stood, right? Uh, yes, it was on Wii, but, but it wasn't on the Wii U up until this point. So even the reviewers had it. We're like, we don't see Netflix on the Wii U. We don't know how, you know, I guess it's not coming. Were and those Netflix production units that they were reviewing? Exactly. Yeah. And Netflix uh, said, oh, we figured, we, we got ourselves in the first update somehow, even though Hulu, Amazon, and, and Nintendo's own TV service isn't in there. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we talked a little bit about this on Tech News Today. And uh, boy, for, for somebody who traditionally handles, uh, as, I, as I put it earlier, like second only to Apple in the clarity and precision of the way they roll out their projects, uh, this definitely seemed like a botch release because making big promises with the TV service and then not being able to deliver until it's pushed back for another month, having the giant fat update, having the bricking, the fact that uh, the, the Wii 
uh, the Wii U can't upscale existing Wii games. Uh, in fact, uh, Wired made an article called 10 Things I Hate About Wii U, and they list uh, real fast uh, the giant update. They say a brutally slow OS, the Netflix uh, not working out of the box. They the say, yeah, short- they say it basically sucks. It's there, but it sucks. <laughs> right. The, uh, the, the small battery in the game pad, uh, the, the social media, the Miiverse, apparently you immediately get your <laughs> account banned or set up for review if you put anything in your Mi account that makes it possible to figure out who you are in real life. So it's, it's a social network where you are not allowed to find any of your friends, which is a curious <laughs> way to go on. That's really odd. Uh, yeah, playing old Wii games, the backwards compatibility is apparently not very good. Uh, there's some non-functional buttons on the home screen. And uh, yeah, and the, it, it's just, it's not getting rave reviews out of the box. And it does, it does. I'm sorry, Brian. I think, you know, I hate, I hate to call anything a botched release, especially when I haven't got my hands on the actual unit yet. I played with pre-production units that were fine, but I was just playing a game. I wasn't doing sure. any of this other stuff. Right. And it sounds like well, it's not ready. Yeah. Sounds like well, it to I, me. And I'm not going to say it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's a botched release, but certainly this is well, well, well below our expectations uh, from what Nintendo has given us in the past. They have, they have played much better ball than they're, than they are this game. Their head's not in the game right now. That's all I'm saying. And this is good hardware. I, I'll, I'll swear to that. I've, cause I've used the hardware. And and it and it, it can perform when it's running the right software. It is, it's all software that seems to be the issue here, which on the one hand is horrible because like really you released your product without having the software ready. On the right. other hand, it does mean they have a chance to fix it. Right. With more huge, ungainly large updates. Right. Uh, another thing that got updates was Google TV. Uh, if you have an LG smart TV, you're ahead of the pack. They're getting all these Google TV updates first, but they will be rolling out most of them. Uh, to the second generation boxes, even the first generation boxes are getting a couple of these things. One is on live, uh, added to the LG Smart TV. Uh, another is uh, Google TV Voice Search. This is the one that you won't get on the first gen boxes, but uh, you will be able to just speak. Uh, I, you know, sh- some contextual things too, like uh, show me movies with Christian Bale, and it'll be able to find all the movies with Christian Bale uh, and tell you whether they're available either on any live TV that you've got hooked up or any of the services like Netflix or Hulu or any of the things that, that you're using. I take that back. I don't think Hulu has an app for Google TV yet, but Netflix does, and, and Google Play Store it would look at. There's also a new primetime guide uh, in the update uh, that tries to tie in and improve the ability to show you all of the things that you have available to watch uh, at the time. It's just called primetime. It, it's kind of confusing because it doesn't necessarily bear specifically on what's Broadcasting in prime time. time, yeah. Uh, it's just again another way to look at all the things available to watch. I wonder if this will be available also on the uh, Vizio CoStar. That's one of the second gen devices, so yeah. it will get it eventually. The, L- the LG is the one that's getting everything first. Hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. I'm inordinately excited about the voice search stuff, and especially as uh, contextualization gets better. Because uh, essentially what we're doing is we're all zeroing in on having our own Jarvis, right? Because it's like uh, we're, we're becoming accustomed to the idea. You're on Jeff Sirian. Jarvis? Uh, yes, Jeff Jarvis there. No, 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 Jarvis from the Iron Man franchise. Oh, yes, that Jarvis. Yeah, you, <laughs> that you just sense. walk into a room and you say, I want something like this. And then it pops it up there. It's like, I, I love it, man. And it's like, uh, I'm excited because I believe now that this is going to happen in my lifetime in the next 10 years. You'll be able to have casual conversations with your consoles and get stuff done effectively just by using natural voice language. Like I, I've already learned the knack of talking to Siri uh, almost casually, but uh, in another five years, it's going to be exceptional. And yeah. you know what? The guide isn't getting as much play as the voice search because the voice search is flashy. But what it does is it learns your preferences and tries to find things that you might want to watch that are available to watch. If you're constantly watching Archer, you know, it's going to say, oh, well, there's, here's some other great animated stuff. Yeah, that's, that's been going on for a while, though. DirecTV does it. Um, Dish may. I, I've switched from Dish to DirecTV. But I know that DirecTV, as I start watching TV content, you know, when I, when I go into the menu, it'll say, oh, you might like this and this and this. This is what's on right now. Imagine, though, and th- this is what Google's trying to do here, is if instead of seeing the grid every time and having to scroll through it was like oh well these are you seem to watch these channels the most so we'll put these up at the top uh-huh. oh you seem to like these kinds of shows so we'll we'll make those easier to find at the top of the grid you know it's like it's that kind of thing that's, right. that makes it that separates it we'll, we'll see how well it works but yep. pretty cool 
Uh, Dish Network has got something out called the Hop. Uh, well, they have something called the Hopper. We sure. talked about that last week and the fact that it, at least for now, is going to be allowed to be continued to sell. They're still in court over it. Over the commercial skipping. Yeah, the commercial skipping part of the Hopper right. box. They're getting an off-air digital TV tuner. And don't be put off by that. It basically means an over-the-air tuner that you can plug in by USB and get all of your available digital channels. You, the Hopper couldn't do that to begin with? No, because it, the Hopper was only getting the Dish channels. Oh. And, and so here's the thing, right? Because you might think, well, Dish has local channels. What's the big deal? If your local CBS station broadcasts five digital channels, Dish doesn't provide all five. Ah. They, you know, it, sure. But this will. And so suddenly, now your hopper is not recording just the main cha- broadcast from all of these channels. And all those things get recorded on the hopper. They're getting all your sub-channels Got as it. well. So, you know, there's antenna TV. And right. there, there's, uh, there's, sometimes there's cable networks that broadcast on these off-channels uh-huh. on digital. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Fox a lot of times. In the summer, they'll have two baseball games that they'll they'll show regionally, mm-hmm. and then the and then the second Fox Digital Channel will show the other baseball game. Right, uh, stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and thirty bucks from the Dish Online Store. I'm there. Right on. Update also allows you to pair Bluetooth audio devices with the DVR. Uh, see album art on Sirius XM. There's a few other things coming in a in a software update that goes along with this as well. Let's take a break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. I use it for my books. I was like, you know what? I I just want an easy place to tell people all the books that I've self-published. And and if they ask, like, where can I get your books? Where can I go? But I want it to look good, and I suck at design. So I went to Squarespace. I started meritbooks.squarespace.com. I didn't spend any time, and I was able to get a decent-looking website. I actually use Squarespace myself to create a website for a concert that I'm producing in December called Tuba Christmas. Oh, really? Yep. Hundreds of tubas playing Christmas carols. You haven't lived till you've heard 200 tubas play Jingle Bells. That sounds pretty amazing. So go. It, it, all, it's at tubachristmasla.com. Tuba Christmas LA. And now I made just by wrote, Squarespace. I made with the default Squarespace ID, but you've got a domain name, which I they do. can do that I as well. I spend a little money. It takes a little money to do that, but... You know, I wanted to uh, I wanted to have an easy domain for people to get to, and uh, it's got all the information. If anybody's in LA and wants some holiday cheer, <laughs> it's it's so easy to use now. Uh, you actually it see is. the site the way the viewer is going to see it when they download it, and then you see some little controls that you can click and say, "I want to edit that" or "I want to move this picture around." They also resize your images for different platforms, so seven different images. The template's customized so that they look correct if somebody's on a phone or a tablet or a big screen. Uh, it's faster and easier than ever, but you don't even have to take our word for it. Go to squarespace.com right now, and you don't need anything. It's anything special. You don't need to ask permission. You don't put any code. Just go to Squarespace and start making your website. It's that easy. You don't need to give them any information. You've got a trial where you can import your current blog if you have one or just mess around with the templates. Now, if you do like the service and you want to pay for it, you should remember this code, frame rate 11 because if you do use that code, that offer code gets you 10% off first purchase on new Squarespace accounts, including monthly and annual plans. And don't forget, if you want a domain name, be fancy, like Scott Wilkinson, <laughs> you can get a free domain name when you sign up for an annual plan, and you get 10% off when you use the code frame rate. Squarespace.com, we thank them for their support of frame rate. Brian, should we do film foul? No. Yes. Oh. Wait. <laughs> no. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. We're doing film foul. I think Jason decided. We're doing. Uh, wow. Are there some awesome film foul stories? Film foul, of course, our section of our show where we talk about the things you can watch uh, that you might want to watch. And we've been going on for a long time about House of Cards, uh, the yep, Kevin yep, Spacey yep. vehicle coming to Netflix. Uh, can we take a look at the trailer, actually? Because what I like, what I love about it, are the tones that remind me just a little bit of uh, Fight Club. The middle of being in the middle of a scene and turning to the camera and talking to us directly. Yeah, uh, forget I'll, Lily. I'll you, I'll I'll execute the office of the president of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office. Of Power the is a lot like real estate. It's all about location, location, location. The closer you are to the source, the higher your property value. Centuries from now, when people watch this footage, who will they see smiling just at the edge of the frame? So help me God. Congratulations. This is going to be a big year for us. 
This is the memo I've drafted on our Middle East policy we've been developing. I'd like to coin the phrase trickle-down diplomacy. That Frank, way... we are not nominating you for Secretary of State. I know he made you a promise, but circumstances have changed. The nature of promises, Linda, is that they remain immune to changing circumstances. Uh -oh. I know you shouldn't trust that woman. I didn't. I don't. I don't trust anyone. Then how could you not see this coming? Walker just nominated Kern. It's a long road to confirmation. I protect your identity. I print whatever you tell me, and I'll never ask any questions. So we're talking about trust. <laughs> what is it you want? Your absolute, unquestioning loyalty. Anything. We're in a very gray area, ethically, legally, which I'm okay with. Shelley Barnes with the Washington Herald boarding a source close to the president. I'm not exactly sure. I got access to CNN. Yeah. I want it yeah, over. I'm sorry, Mr. President, but I will not do that. Get ready, Kathy. Things are about to move very quickly. Okay. I'm ready. Do you understand how you're to behave? And if I don't play alone? We'll cleave you from the herd and watch you die in the wilderness. Promise me it wouldn't be like this. We'll have a lot of nights like this. Making plans. Very little sleep. I expected that. Take a step back. Look at the bigger picture. That's how you devour a whale. One bite at a time. Give and take. Welcome to Washington. Dude, this is... Here's what's remarkable. There are two things that are remarkable. First of all, I guarantee I don't think any of us planned to show that entire trailer here on Frame Rate, but instead <laughs> we got sucked in and it plays just as well audio as it does video. And uh, second of all, how quickly did you forget that this is a Netflix story? Oh, this yeah. is just an awesome looking movie or t series. Yeah, absolutely. Now, obviously, it, it is a, uh, a redo of the House of Cards that was done in by the BBC. I think it was by the BBC. It was done in the UK. Uh, but it but it has turned into a series, uh, which is a little bit of a different take. And it's obviously the U.S. government, not the U.K. government. It's got, but it's got big names. It's got big producers behind it. Uh, and Netflix certainly not the first to do original series as an Internet entity. YouTube obviously funding all of their channels. Hulu's got a ton of original series on there that are very good. But this, to my mind, is the best looking one. This, yes. this obviously, and, and apparently HBO was bidding on this. Uh, and Netflix came in and just swept the rug out from under them. Yeah, we, we covered it back in the day. I want to say that there was like $100 million Netflix play, paid for this. It was unreal, the, the commitment they made. So I, I definitely look at this and say, yes, if this was, if you said coming to HBO, coming to Showtime at the end of this thing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't have blinked an eye. Uh, yeah, this, this is high, perfectly reasonable. Yeah. High quality program. You bet. Uh, Aaron Sorkin is writing the Steve Jobs film that is based on the Walter Isaacson uh, authorized autobiography. There's another film being made that stars Ashton Kutcher as Steve Jobs. That is a different movie, and it's not based on the Isaacson book. Uh, Sorkin has revealed, what do you guys think of this? There's only going to be three scenes in the book, or uh, in the movie. One scene is backstage before the announcement of the original Mac. One scene before the announcement of Next when Steve Jobs was no longer at Apple, and one scene backstage before the announcement of the iPod. That's the each, entire movie? Each scene is 30 minutes long. Oh, my God. And, uh, I love it. And written by Aaron Sorkin, so snappy, snappy dialogue. Well, super snappy, yeah. 30 minutes of feel, Aaron Sorkin. Uh, uh, I think it's going to feel almost like a play, I would imagine, and that you get, because sure. everything's real time. You're just in this location. You, you got three acts. I I. I think it sounds like a really good way to differentiate itself from, uh, you know, whatever that other project's going to be, the Ashton Kutcher one. Yeah, it, it it sounds like it could go horribly wrong, and it could if you didn't have <laughs> the right person directing it, if you didn't have the right, right actor. So a lot, of, a lot hinges on the execution of it. But I certainly think that Aaron Sorkin's the right guy to write this sort of thing. I would yeah. agree. He's doing a lot of research on his own, too. I mean, he's, he, he's going and talking with the folks who worked on the original Mac, who worked at Next, who, who worked on the iPod. Uh, I'll be very curious to see how it plays out. Disney, uh, according to the register, doesn't plan to just do episodes 7, 8, and 9. They're talking about doing uh, three Lucasfilm movies every year. Now, not three Star Wars movies, but they're, they're, they want to crank up the, the volume at Lucasfilm. 
Now, what other, uh, these have to be new properties that they're going to get them to work on, right? Well, yeah, would, like, I would think so. There might be some yeah. spinoffs or, or side projects, et cetera, but some of them are going to have to be fully original to keep that pace up. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, well, I, Lucasfilm certainly doesn't put out three movies a year the way it is right now. So no. I don't know if they're going to get an infusion of cash, if they're going to build up the division and uh, <laughs> uh, get a lot more people working on it. Uh, that seems awfully ambitious for that entity the way it is now. And, and I never had the impression that Lucasfilm was sitting on a lot of uh, movie making potential that they failed to exercise. So well, what I this where... sounds like is this Kathleen Kennedy, who now runs Lucasfilm under Disney, uh, says to Entertainment Weekly that the company aims to make two or three films a year. So it sounds like Lucasfilm is going from being a vehicle for making Star Wars films to being a movie studio. Saying, you know what, we, we, we want to make a couple, couple of three movies a year. Let's, let's use what we've got. Let's use this talent. Yeah. Seems, well, seems right good. to me. Yeah. The first nine minutes of Star Trek Into Darkness. Remember, there's no colon. It's just Star Trek Into Darkness. The next Star Trek J.J. Abrams movie will premiere in IMAX theaters next month. So if you go to see The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, you're going to have to choose. Do you want HFR? Or do you want to see the Star Trek trailer? Now, I will say you don't necessarily have to make that choice. Is that because right? Is some there a way to... IMAX theaters are going to have HF... HFR. But not all of them. Not all so of them. So you have to choose carefully. Right. And what you have to do is you have to go to a website called 48fpsmovies.com. And when you go to 48fpsmovies.com, you'll be able to click out, find a link to a list of all the theaters that are showing The Hobbit in HFR. And some of them are IMAX theaters. All right, so if I if I find that forty eight frames per second theater list, then I just have to look down the list until I find. You have to ones find where the where the link be, is. Well, I have to. You have to find your state. Uh, but for instance, Alhambra Renaissance Stadium fourteen and IMAX is an HFR theater. Now yep. they have an IMAX theater and they are HFR. Does that necessarily mean that the IMAX is HFR? What if they have an HFR theater? You know, there's fourteen screens. Well, they're not going to call. I, I don't think anyway. Okay. My assumption is they're not going to. Dis- Say specifically that this this the Alhambra IMAX theater in the whatever whatever the complex is mm. is gonna is gonna be the HFR. Uh, they're gonna they would say it would be in the in the in the complex in the Alhambra 14 or whatever it's called. Uh, they wouldn't identify IMAX if it wasn't gonna be an HFR. Gateway Stadium 16 and IMAX, Brian. That's yours. Yes. No. Uh, I believe. Uh, oh no. Wait. No. IMAX. Ah, if you want to get HFR there's, there's, and IMAX, that's you're the not getting one. me out of the Alamo Draft House, buddy. It's not going to happen. Nice try, <laughs> sir. Well, then the you're league. not going to see the Star Trek trailer. Nine minutes too. That's a lot of them. That's, that's a lot of a piece yeah, of movie. And again, I, I I guess this is good for building hype, but it's like, uh, is this really going to be something that will convince people to go see the Star Trek movie that weren't otherwise going to see it? It just like I I always associate giving away this much of a free a movie for free with uh, properties that need the exposure and i wouldn't think that star trek needs the exposure no, the dark but again, knight was the last one the, i remember uh, it, it, to me it's it's not they need the exposure it's they, they want, want to boost people going to this particular kind of theater yes exactly right they're, they're, they're trying to build buzz for the for the movie which is already going to be plenty buzzworthy enough but yes also uh going to the high-end theater to experience it in this, you know, in IMAX or whatever. Because the the uh, the Dark Knight Rises in 3D, or oh, no, wait, not the I can't now I can't remember what the movie was. There was a movie that if you saw it in IMAX, you got a few minutes of the Dark Knight Rises mm. long before it came out, ah. and actually before they redid the the vocal track. Oh really? I remember when I saw the Dark Knight Rises, I was like, oh, the the, the evil guy sounds different than he did in the Bane in the lead. Yeah, Bane. The, the voice right. Did you call the, the the lead guy? Yeah, you know. <laughs> fun, I could, uh, I, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Bad Stuff. Mr. Uh, he was up there with the, with the face mask. And he sounded like a grandpa all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah. I, love right. I don't know. He was the bad guy. <laughs> but, by the way, regarding The Hobbit, I also want to mention that it's also going to be in some theaters, not in IMAX theaters, it, the sound format is Dolby Atmos. Oh, right, because there's another vector. There's another vector. Not only is it going to be in 3D See, okay. at high frame rate, it's going to have I mean, Dolby Atmos, which is many channels of audio around you and above you. Scott, you know I respect you. You know that you're the man, and I trust you on just about everything. Uh-oh. However, 
you know, you're, you're, you're pitching me this Venn diagram where you got your Atmos, you got your HFR, you got your IMAX. And in the know. Middle, maybe there is that one perfect movie theater, but guess what? Movie theater I'm going to serves beer. <laughs> that's another vector. Well, that's, that's another, another vector, vector in the diagram. Are you going to be able to get a beer delivered to your seat? I, I, I do know that The Hobbit is going to be available in at least seven different formats. And you the know? beer wow. is served in seven different <laughs> Uh, I mean, you got your 2D, you got your 3D, you got your HFR, you got your... You got your IPA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, check in on the winter movie draft. Who will lose? Who will win? Well, it was I'm the big weekend for us. Sarah Lane getting $141 million out of the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2. How's it looking, Brian? Uh, I don't know. You know, it's um, uh, the the question is: Will they have week over week momentum? Obviously, that's a huge, huge opening. But uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I'm just making up numbers, I'm gonna say this thing's gonna top out around 300 million. So she'll, she's certainly into very respectable territory. But I'm a little more optimistic now than I was. I, I, I mean, first of all, I'm still convinced you're gonna win. But I think that I've got a chance with Lincoln to drift up to maybe 350. I think Sarah will beat me, though. I was talking to Sarah earlier, and she's like, her worry is that the other movies she has will not be enough to, to float her above the competition. Uh, for instance, Red Dawn, Thanksgiving, 20 million. Thanksgiving movie. A Thanksgiving movie is going to get a little more than, a, than another movie would normally get. But sure. how many people are going to say, ooh, I'm full of pumpkin pie and turkey. Let's go see Red Dawn. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a patriotic yeah. time, and especially if you got people who, uh, you know, my demographic that remembers the movie from when they were kids, uh, going and checking it out. But uh, my I don't know. saving grace here is not The Hobbit. I have The Hobbit, and that's going to put me in contention. But I think the thing that that it makes or breaks me is Rise of the Guardians, which have also you seen comes the trailers out. for Rise of the Guardians? I saw the entire movie. What? Yep. All I, right, spill it. I got to go to a preview. It is gorgeous. Yeah, it, the, is the it good? visuals is are beautiful. The three D is very effective. I happen to be a fan of three D. I know not everybody is. I am. I thought th the three D was extremely effective. In fact, I had the director Peter Ramsey on as a guest on the Tech Guy this weekend, and uh, very interesting guy. First, his first feature film, uh, the first black director to get a feature animation from DreamWorks. Um, and I thought he did just an incredible job. Uh, Guillermo del Toro was also involved as executive director. Oh, wow. And what a great premise. The premise is, what if Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and Jack Frost, and the Sandman were all buddies? In fact, superheroes. Uh, protecting the innocence of children. The Avengers of Innocence. The, uh, the Avengers of Innocence. And and the bad guy is uh, Pitch Black, voiced by Jude Law. Really, really good. Really awesome. good. I, I thought that was a fabulous movie. I highly recommend it. It comes out November 21st, I think, next week. All right, that's, let's do it. Uh, that's when you'll know. That's you'll know. Basically, uh, and by the way, on the memes, on, on the other side, Justin Robert Young has made a stake bet against my assistant, John Tilton, that uh, he does not believe that the movie will even make $150 million. John Tilton says it definitely will because it's, you know, an animated feature that has freaking Santa Claus right before the holidays. Right. Uh, you're Although it's know. not a Christmas movie. In no, fact, no, the, no, the yeah. time frame is Easter. That's weird. Oh, interesting. Which is a little weird. But I will also say Santa Claus voiced by Alec Baldwin doing a Russian accent. Very good. Awesome. I don't know if it'll well, break $150 million. Justin may still win his stake bet, but I, it doesn't have to to help me what, out. Here, here's my point, Tom, is you're going to know opening weekend. If this thing has a huge opening weekend, you're gonna, we can pretty much declare you the winner at that yeah. point. All right. Well, we're running, we're running really long today because we're just having too much fun. Uh, let's, let's do a real quick version of what we're watching. <laughs> watching uh i watched twilight breaking dawn part two great battle scene uh, was there really yeah no there's an excellent battle scene no other reason for people who aren't already into twilight to see it uh so maybe wait till it comes to you know hbo or dvd or something like that and then uh and then watch like skip to the end and watch the battle scene absolutely incredible right on and yeah. so you uh, you saw blood and chrome though i believe I, I started watching blood and chrome I can't believe this thing is not on television. It's amazing. Uh, it, God, it's so good. God. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's like I get mad. It's like that's the one 
you see, from everything you see, you're like, okay, that's the one excuse where it makes sense where sci-fi would drop the stupid ball on this and ruin everything is, is if it turned out to be bad and it just didn't make the cut. But then knowing it's good that it got fireflied before it even got released. Yeah. It's me off. Uh, and then uh, I watched, I, I caught up all seven er- episodes of Arrow, which is a CW take on the green Arrow. Uh, and it's, it's a superhero series. It's, 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 it's watchable. It's great. I enjoyed it. Loved it. I right ate them all up like candy this weekend. So, uh, Scott, what do you what have you been watching? Well, um, I saw Rise of the Guardians, of course, which I thought was great. I went and saw Lincoln. Fabulous movie. Really good. On TV, I got to tell you, I, I didn't get into The Big Bang Theory when it started, but I've recently started catching up with it, and it's f- fabulous. I just love it. Of course, I'm a geek, and they're all yeah, geeks, yeah. and it's very geeky. So, you know, uh, but... But uh, I don't know why I didn't start with it. But a couple of my friends said, "You really got to start watching this," and so I did, and it's really, really good. That's one I'd like. I should get back. I should get back into that. I bailed out like a few episodes into the first season. Brian, what have you been watching? Uh, of course, Always Sunny in Philadelphia continues to be freaking hilarious this season. Uh, Walking Dead, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, still live streaming the Walking Dead video game. But you got to tell you, man. These days, I'm more interested and excited about the next episode of The Walking Dead video game than I am for the television show, which is not necessarily a testament to the, how the show's going, although we'll talk about that, but so much as, as a testament of how good the video game story is. And uh, somebody tipped me off to a movie called The Man from Earth, which I just started and then got pulled away from, but I love the setup for it. It looks like, it, talking about that Steve Jobs movie where it's three vignettes uh, just all real time in this one place, uh, this is a story of a guy who basically confesses to his intellectual um, professor friends that he uh, never ages and, in fact, has been alive since, uh, you know, for 14,000 years and has watched all of humanity come and go uh, during that time. And uh, I'm really interested with the premise, so I'll tell you how I liked it once I finished the thing. Let's do a quick couple of feedbacks. Now it's time for Feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio, yeah. Sean would like to pose a question. It's the future, 10 years from now. At a Song of Ice and Fire has completed its run on HBO, George R. R. Martin has completed his epic tale, and the masses need something to fill the void. What is the next fantasy novel series that should be transformed into the visual medium of television? Go, Brian. Uh, dude, that's that's a no-brainer. If it's ever going to happen, it'll happen in 10 years, and it's got to be Stephen King's The Dark Tower series because right now, obviously, uh, HBO is super invested in uh, in this fantasy franchise, and they got a long, long time until they start something else. But my hope is seven years from now, after seeing the success of Game of Thrones, seven years from now, they'll take on as big an epic journey uh, with The Dark Tower. I would love to see Dune. Not a miniseries, that's that's doing a little better than a movie, uh, but an actual like long series that commits to doing all six episodes of Dune the way they've committed to doing Game of Thrones and doing it right. That's that's what I would absolutely love to see. Uh, Scott, do you have a thought on this? I do. Um, I just finished rereading the the three original Foundation uh, books by Ooh, Isaac Asimov, yeah. and I I was thinking the whole Ooh, time through, man, I would love to see that produced in in a video f- movie some sort of format and then aside from the, those last three those original three there are a bunch more now you know yeah. so that could be fodder for a long time some network could play that out forever exactly yeah. all right uh next next email and then we're out yes sir uh josh writes us hey guys one thing that was not brought off by the bro- blogs and podcasts including frame rate in regards to disney purchase of lucasfilm was the distribution rights to the original six films according to hollywood reporter uh episodes five uh, uh yeah episodes five four yeah 20th century fox owns the distribution rights to episodes five four six and the and the prequel everything but a new hope until 20 right exactly uh but the episode four a new hope is forever owned by Fox to do with whatever they want. In other words, for Disney to release it in a mega box set, which I personally don't care about, in 2020 with the new sequels, they would have to make a deal with Fox. Do you think Disney would try to buy the rights to episode four from Fox or would be forced to cut a licensing fee? I mean, the the answer is obvious. They'll, They'll have some lawyers hash out a bunch of crap in the back room and they'll you'll get your box set. I mean, I to be honest, I, I really don't care who gets money for what. <laughs> well, and I'm not sure that that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. We did talk about it. I can't remember if it was on Tech News Today or Frame Rate or, or just, just off air, but, but uh, they can get the rights back after a, a long period of time 
uh, it, but it, 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 or, or wait a minute, no, it's it's the it's the it's the f- other five movies that they can get the rights back to. Uh, he's right about Fox having right of first refusal, but they can buy it. They can buy those. I mean, Disney can buy them from Fox. Fox might not be willing to sell them. That's one of the reasons you don't have Firefly right now is that Fox is making too much money selling merchandise and DVDs, uh, and it's too expensive to to get the rights to Firefly back. Uh, and you, so you have to get their approval to make a make a TV show. But I thought we did talk about that. Maybe it just wasn't on frame rate. So good good point. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Scott Wilkinson, thank you, man. So it's, pl- it's great so to, glad to be on. here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let folks know where they can find Home Theater Geeks or anything else you're doing online. Well, certainly uh, Home Theater Geeks is on the Twit.tv network. Twit.tv slash htg. I'm also answering uh, reader and listener questions at uh, Secrets of Home Theater and High Fidelity. The web- website is hometheaterhifi.com. I answer a question a week there, and I also post uh, very technical, very deep articles once in a while. Uh, well, up now is part one of how LCD TVs work, and I mean I'm talking at the molecular level. So um, check that out, and uh, certainly Home Theater Geeks, and whenever Leo's out of town, I'll be filling in for him and Happy to do so. Excellent. Uh, Go buy the Scam School books so that Brian's daughters can eat something besides gruel. And you can come find us at twit.tv slash fr. We we stream it live every Monday at pretty much 3.30 Pacific time. Uh, You can find all the episodes on demand, twit.tv slash fr. And email us, framerate, at twit.tv. A small spoiler zone coming up. If we're not sticking around for that, though, we'll see you next time. So, Brian, after mm-hmm. last week's episode, I disagreed with you about the phone call. I thought, no, <laughs> I think this is fine. I think this is an interesting time to introduce it, and we can play that story out, and it'll be fun. After this week's episode, I 100% agree with you about the phone call. <laughs> like, what? I, I, it was, uh, what did you think? Uh, okay, here's the problem, right? The whole the scene with the phone, he is desperate and lost, and he immediately, some stranger says, hey, man, we're strangers. Or he's like, can I come live with you? It's terrible here. We're totally screwed. And then meanwhile, that's the whole purpose of them showing up in the prison is that so that they can get a brief respite from the, the, the outrageousness of the, of the wild where they can have, build their own little civilization and actually breathe a sigh of relief. So then more horrible crap can happen to them and we have to freak out again. And the fact that they that we've never gotten that we've never yet had an unclinching. We've never seen even they, they've never sold us on the idea that the prison is safe. They've never sold us that they could build a little family and be OK. Instead, they do the work, the, the opposite, which is in the middle of what should be their nest of safety. We see uh, Rick losing his crap, crying, saying, I don't know who you are, or where you are, but please take us in. And then, oh, by the way, I'm crazy pants bananas. Uh, no. Well, see, no, you no. Not, see, that bothered me less because you weren't on board with him being crazy pants to begin with. I, I was okay with that. So, the, sure. so him losing it with the phone, I was, I was okay with. Even the second voice, I was like, oh, okay, so they're going to make it be all of the dead people he knows. That's interesting. But then when they're like, okay, well, we'll see you later because this is Laurie. And I was like, what? You just, re- that's it? You revealed it? You, you kind of blew the, the whole part that I was, I was, I was into. The part that I, I wanted to get strung out where he actually thought it was, it was people who were safe. And he starts telling everyone about it and gets them excited. I was expecting Herschel to find that the thing wasn't plugged in or something, right? Right. And and, okay, and, and, and and that could be a reveal, but... Was it just me, or was it a bit much out of nowhere for them to just start this episode on the hunt for Michonne? Because, like, they ended last episode. Like, I thought, like, wait, did we jump an episode? They ended with a full-on, like, see you later. Well, here we go. There was yeah, no I, scene. I, I know. I, I was okay with that. I caught, I, I could, I'm smart enough to catch up and be like, oh, okay, so they let her go, but we all knew something's going on, and so they said... She can't go, and they sent Merle out to get her. Like, I, I, I filled in the blank in my head fast enough. I'm like, all right, that all makes sense. I could see yeah. the governor doing that. I could see Merle being the guy for the job. That didn't bother me. Yes. Okay. And and okay. So it's a minor infraction. I am going to say a bigger infraction with the 
increased doughy wimpification of the governor and his little romance with Andrea. The late, I, I, what are you, the He-Man Woman's ha Haters Club? He can't, he can't have a relationship? He can't find no, love, Brian? It's not the governor. That's not the character. That's not what that's makes him because one of the most That's because that's not the villains. governor from the book. That's, it's, it's a terrible character he's playing right now. I hate but the character. But you're going to love it when Michael Rooker shoves that knife right up in the governor's head, aren't you? No, he's not going to. Instead, we're going to see a weird, like, there's, and, and by the way, what's with this uh, unexplained immunity Michonne has uh, to where she's like got invisibility Oh, no, that's power. just because she's covered in the gunk. She, she looks down at all the gunk all over. Remember she had the, the split oh, guts okay. like spilled all over her? That's that's what yeah. that that's basically rediscovering and reintroducing that plot point. Is yeah, like, hey, no, if you're if you're covered in zombie guts, which nobody would like to be, the right. zombies leave you alone, and and okay. that's going to play out in a way to like get out of something. Well, the way that scene, and now that I'm replaying that scene in my mind, I totally see that's what they were trying to say. But at the time, I got the impression not that uh, she was discovering that it was the guts that made her invisible, but that there was something more interesting that had all of the zombies' oh, attention. Yeah, 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 and so I was like, "What's this other thing going to be?" And then it, and then there there was no payoff scene for that, so that was weird. But look, uh, here's the thing: still on probation, just like last week's episode. Pulled down major notch, and I was like, oh, I'm worried, guys. This week's episode was just good enough that I'm not not willing to turn on the series, but you you slipped a little bit more rope. I need you, guys, I need you, I need you to pick it back up. I need right. you to kill that stupid governor. Last, last week's episode, I don't know if I mentioned this, but for me, last week's episode was uh for, was sort of like, oh, it's okay to have a breather episode. This the season has been so good. This week's episode, I was definitely mad about the phone call. But I've, I'm really starting to think, I just have to remember this isn't the book. And, and, and in some ways, I wish I'd never read the book because I think I'd have an entirely different feel for the rhythm of things because okay, it's, but, still the, it's still the, what Robert Kirkman does so well is everything's safe, everything's not safe. Everything's safe, everything's not safe. And inside the prison, he's doing it differently, but it's still everything's safe, everything's not safe. There is, uh, okay, okay. And, and keep in mind, all of my complaints, because I'm seeing some chatter in the chat room, and I'm like, it's not the comic book. you got to let that go. None of this are complaints about the comic book outside of I've seen a glimpse of what the governor character could be, and it's awesome. And I don't know. Uh, uh, th but this that's is a complaint about the book, Brian. Right. No, no, no. That, that is. That is the yeah. one thing that, 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 I will, that I will admit is a complaint about it. Uh, however, my complaints are about inconsistencies of characters as we've seen them on the show, inconsistencies of storytelling and, and missed opportunities. Uh, I, I hate the governor as he's being played now. Uh, is there anyone who has just been watching the show who can look me in the eye on the Internet and say, no, man, I think this governor is a very compelling character? He's complicated and interesting and surprising. It's like he's he's a he's a wuss. He's a wuss and a softy. And I he's don't. He's a I gentleman, don't... Brian. No, he's, cultured. he's a coward. He knows good whiskey. He knows how to treat a lady and show her a good time at the fights. He's, he's a coward and doughy, and I'm not afraid of him. And even at the, at this point, even if he does something terrible, I'll regard him as a petulant, angry child throwing a tantrum, and not as a force of nature to be feared. Which is, and again, that is just the fault of having seen the I, guy. I, from yeah, no, the governor doesn't bother me at all if I don't compare him to the book. I, I think he's he's a perfectly believable and fine character. He doesn't have to be like that kind of character. I, I, I understand your frustrations, but I think they're all pretty much rooted in, and you, you want the governor to be somebody he's not, Brian. You know, you just need to accept him for who he is. Uh, who he is is boring and dumb. Exactly. How about that? Wait, he's not dumb. He may be a little bit more boring than the governor we he's, knew. He's not dumb enough to see through Merle's lies. He's, he's not, oh, he he's so, totally sees through Merle's lies. Are you kidding me? Oh, really? You think he's just so, sort of uh, letting he, him he, blow he, smoke? He knows Merle. Th yeah, no, he, there, he gave Merle a look, and, and he doesn't want Merle to know he knows. There's a little thing thing going on there. I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Also, Interesting. Merle's going to become the governor. Just saying. Can I just I say one so. thing about the governor? Yeah. Yeah, go. If you watch him and think of Bill Pullman... There's there's a really strange uh, connection there that I can't get over. I didn't um, seriously. I didn't read the book. I didn't read this the series. Oh, so you're the one. You're the one. I'm, I'm the ask. one. So I'm probably the one. At least one of the, the ones. One who was told to us. Um, yeah, he doesn't bother me, but his character isn't very compelling to me either. 
Like I'm not right. if if his whole thing is that he's supposed to be this, you know, controlling this entire kind of subculture, which is kind of you know why he's the governor and everything. But he's supposed to have this kind of uh, unavoidable power or aura about him. I don't really get that from him, and I don't know if it's an acting thing or if it's just the character that's being portrayed in the story. But because he's a gentleman, yeah, I guess so. But there is there is little to be. Uh, to fear in him, and I, I kind of get the feeling from the book that you get that a little bit more. That oh, you... well, he's an entirely different character in the book. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, and, and it's very, the very is... clearly not the same character. Right. Yeah, he's he's like you know he's a smooth politician uh, uh, I, in the in the television. But like, what was neat about the book was you had this populace that the, he was a ruthless. Uh, fear-inducing tyrant who created these games of blood sport to placate the <laughs> masses. And it was obvious to the people who were in Woodbury that they were all terrified of him and terrified of his wrath, but they respected and found comfort in being ruled in this. They found safety so valuable in this chaotic world that they gladly accepted his his tyranny in order to do And that's a fascinating dynamic. And that's what made Woodbury a compelling uh, uh, organization to be this polar opposite of what we were seeing develop and flourishing in the prison. And we just don't have any of that this time. <sighs> All right. Well, next week, Walking Dead. How much, how many more episodes do we have this season? I don't know, actually. Good question. Hmm. I have no idea. Time? I mean, they're half seasons, so they're like, uh, yeah. what, seven episodes? So we got to be coming up close here. Then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got to come very close. Yeah. All right, that's it for our spoiler zone. Thanks, everybody, uh, for watching. Uh, you, uh, as we mentioned, twit.tv slash FR. We will check in again next week, right, Brian? Yes, sir. And if the governor is watching, I always loved you, and I was just kidding about all that stuff. Please don't he attack me. He accepts you for who you are now. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> Kisses. All right. Yeah, next time you watch uh, the governor, think of Bill Pullman. Oh, and, no, uh, I totally see it. Do you I, see? I, okay. I, yeah, I'm ready to see I was alone on that one. virus. But every time I see him talking with that kind of half smirk, I can't yeah. help but think Bill Pullman.